was the night after Thanksgiving in 2005, and I found myself standing in the middle of a shutdown highway surrounded by flashing lights. This was my first call as a volunteer firefighter. I was 16 years old. And as it was my first call, there wasn't much for me to do but watch. And so I watched my fellow firefighters perform CPR on the five-year-old girl whose family had been in that car accident. And I still remember the color of her shoes and how little she looked laying there on that stretcher. And I just wanted to get back to the firehouse so someone could tell me what I'm supposed to do with the weight of that memory, the memory of a child who could not be saved. But when we got back to the firehouse, there were no words of wisdom. With tears in their eyes, I watched the firefighters take their gear off and go home, and that was it. And I thought, if they aren't talking about these memories, what are they doing with them? At 16 years old, I fell in love with firefighting harder than I had ever loved anything. It was the world I most wanted to be a part of. I had become someone else after putting on fire gear for the first time, after seeing that little girl in that accident, and I dedicated my full self to becoming someone who would always know how to help. And I turned to the firefighters I was getting to know for them to teach me how to be the best firefighter that I could be. But what I didn't realize was that in that firehouse, those firefighters already thought they knew who I was going to be, how I was going to act, walk, talk, based on the stereotype that they had for women firefighters. It was this tiny little box of expectations, and it didn't matter who I wanted to be. They were going to do everything they could to make me fit inside that box. At 16 years old, I was asked to perform sexual favors in exchange for getting my firefighting-related questions answered. They compared me to the naked posters of women hanging on the wall. They told me what they would do to me if they could get me alone. They tampered with my gear, followed me home from school, refused to get on the fire engine for a call if I was already on it. And in the beginning, this just felt like a joke that I was not in on and did not understand. But as it began to happen more and more, it was less of a joke and more of a reflection of how I thought about myself, that I was not a part of this team and that I did not belong. I remember pleading with one of the firefighters there to tell me why these terrible things were happening to me when I just wanted to learn how to be a firefighter. And he stuck his finger in my face and said, Allie, these things are happening because of who you are. You are doing this to yourself. Being a part of that firehouse felt like a zero-sum game, like I had to make a decision. I could give it all up and be rid of the environment that was hurting me, or I could put up with it all and keep doing this thing that I loved. I felt like I had no good options. And at the end of three years there, I was at the end of my rope, but I kept saying to myself, this is just right here. This is just right now. And I thought if I could just get to a different firehouse, things would be better. And so I decided I was going to participate in a ride-along. I was going to go to a busy inner-city firehouse for three days, and this was my Hail Mary. This was my last chance to experience some, something positive in a firehouse. But on the last night of that ride-along, somewhere around three in the morning, I found myself sitting in a pitch-black room, hiding from three very drunk firefighters. They found me in this room while I was just trying to be invisible, and their intentions were very clear. From under the weight of them, I was completely paralyzed, frozen with fear, but I was not surprised, because this had always been threatened to me. It was the ultimate punishment if I did not conform. I felt someone's rough, sweaty hand wrap around my neck, and I felt his fingernails dig into my throat, and I had just one thought. I can't breathe. I didn't just mean in that moment, this world was suffocating me. I felt someone else's hand on the skin of my stomach underneath my shirt, and that feeling shocked me out of being frozen, and I became enraged. I punched and bit and kicked and screamed, and as I ran out of that room, I left the biggest piece of me behind. This was the final loss of control. It was the final weight that I could carry, the millionth little paper cut, the final drop in a bucket that finally made it overflow. All of these experiences had worn me down until I no longer believed that I could exist safely in the world. Now today, I know that there are thousands of good firefighters and thousands of good firehouses, and that these early experiences were not indicative of the fire service as a whole. 
But when it comes to traumatic experiences, sometimes the deck is just not stacked in our favor, and we aren't in control of outside factors like the people involved or the situations that we're put in. And when it comes to managing that kind of stress, we're managing until the day that we aren't, and then we cross a line that we cannot uncross. And when I crossed that line, slowly but surely, I started to feel the effects of all the trauma that I had experienced and all the stress that had been building. I remember sitting in my room at night alone, begging my body to stay awake, because when I was awake, I felt like I could control the panic attacks and the rage, the feeling of being numb, the fear, and when I would fall asleep, nightmares would come. I knew that something was wrong and that I needed help, but I didn't think that help would work for me because I didn't know how to put words to what was going on inside my head. But in all of this, I had one reprieve, and that was the empty pages of my journal. On my first day as a firefighter, I came home, I found a journal that I'd been scribbling in, and I wrote down a couple lines about what that first day felt like. Who I met, what I learned, how heavy all that gear was. But really quickly, that place of writing became the only place where I was recording the truth about what was happening to me. I never dreamed that I would be safe enough or brave enough to say the words out loud. But after leaving that environment, I looked at the 23 journals that I had filled during those three years, these journals that held my truest self. And after years and years of rewriting these memories, I realized that I had written a story that wasn't just about being a girl in a firehouse. It was about what happens when we refuse to conform to other people's idea of who we're supposed to be. About what happens when life requires you to pick a side and to stand up. And I realized that if I had had that story when I was struggling, I would not have felt so alone. And so I worked and worked and saved and saved until I had enough money to print and publish the first 1,000 copies of Where Hope Lives. And I started to travel and stand on stages and remind myself as much as anybody who heard me that we are the only ones who have a say in how our stories go and that we are so much more than the things that happen to us. But publishing my story didn't make the trauma go away. I still needed help piecing it all together and processing it, and I stubbornly struggled by myself for far too long. And there wasn't some big epiphany moment when I finally decided that I was ready for help. The truth is, I just got really sick of it. I got sick of the darkness, sick of living in that rock bottom place, sick of not expecting more from myself. And recovery started when I learned the name for the monster inside my head. Its name was post-traumatic stress disorder, and that meant that I had an injury to the part of my brain that dealt with stress and fear. And in conversations with my beloved therapist, she told me that this injury was as real and as physical as if those firefighters took a baseball bat to my leg and broke it. But just like a broken bone, with proper support and treatment, I could heal. And she was right, I did heal. Healing wasn't linear, but it was cumulative. Every single step forward counted. And these days, the freedom of recovery continues to be more powerful than all the days of trauma combined. I've made it my mission to learn a lot about trauma in the years since, and I've learned that traumatic experiences aren't always just one thing. They can be like a river against a stone, slowly wearing us down over the course of time. And the effects of these traumatic experiences aren't just isolated to one facet of our lives, they affect our entire being. We can't just amputate them away like an unsavable limb. We must work to find cohesion in our life stories and make meaning out of the things that have happened to us. There is no right or wrong way to be a survivor, but I have found so much strength in standing in my story and telling it out loud. I believe that secrets embolden abusers and that silence allows our systems of oppression to continue unimpeded. The truth is the truth, and we need to tell it, no matter how hard it is to say or to hear. My trauma was progressive. It grew and grew and permeated all aspects of my life until I found myself at one singular defining event, surviving an attempted gang rape. And since the day Where Hope Lives was published, my life has been driven by advocacy and by a desire to hold space for others and help them shoulder their burdens. 
And my advocacy needed to start in the same place as my recovery with that event that was the culmination of everything. And so I found myself being trained as a domestic violence and sexual assault counselor. This allowed me to work in a domestic violence shelter and respond to the hospital to be with survivors of sexual assault. And I remember the night of my first call out, I was driving to the hospital thinking of everything I wanted to say to this person, to this brand new survivor. Mostly, I just wanted to tell her that what happened to her was not her fault because that's what I needed to hear so badly all those years ago. I've thought a lot about where hope lives in the nine years since I've published it. I thought a lot about why I did it. It obliterated my chances at ever being anonymous in a firehouse. I'm usually first known as the girl who wrote that book. So why did I do it? Well, if I hadn't done it, I think the story itself would have eaten me alive. I needed to get it out and to give it away. I needed something good to come from all that bad. And I've learned that standing up for yourself, telling your truth out loud and on purpose, and fighting for yourself and for other people, those things aren't without consequence but they matter, and they are so, so worth it. When I first started writing this talk, I did so in my 81st journal. I still write every single day, and in it I wrote a line that said, resilience is an act of rebellion. And I mentioned that to someone, and they said, that's powerful, I think, but what does that mean? And I thought, what does that mean? Why does that feel so true for me? Resilience is an act of rebellion. Well, my life experiences had led me to believe that I was destined to play the role of other people's victim. And in order to have any sort of a future, I needed to actively rebel against those beliefs and constantly prove them wrong. And as my recovery grew, so did my advocacy, until I was finally able to look at the very place and at the very people who hurt me so deeply and see that they deserve to be free of their weights and their burdens too. I believe if we can better understand why we are in pain, then we're less likely to inflict it on others. To put it simply, my work needed to include firefighters, and my recovery allowed me to find compassion for them and fall back in love with the fire service. So I started a company called On the Job and Off, which is an online platform dedicated to building more resilient first responders through education and shared experience. So my resilience and my rebellion have led me right back to where I started over a decade ago, standing among firefighters, proving to myself every day that that is, in fact, where I belong. Thank you.